Well, let's start talking while we're laughing. Uh, this is episode 43. I can't believe we're on episode 43. I've kind of been on hiatus of the orchestra podcast. Uh, everybody and everybody, anybody and everybody knows uh, all of us orchestra teachers and professionals have been really hustling lately. Now the thing, the door is just kind of, the COVID door is cracking open and we're all trying to get a foot through. Uh, me with my students and and performers with with gigs and opportunities, uh, but I'm starting to get back to this podcast because this this is something that I want to continue uh, into the future because we we get to bring on so many guests bringing such diverse perspectives uh, like our guest today we have Shanoa uh, Murphy with us today uh, newly minted Murphy a member of the Murphy clan now. Uh, we got to work together uh, thanks to Dr. Quentin Morris and the Key to Change uh, Solo String Festival, uh, which was such a moving and powerful experience for me. And I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. Uh, but uh, as we're just getting started here, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Let our, our viewers know a little bit about you and what you do. Thank you so much, Nathan, for having me um, on your show. I'm so glad that um, something like this exists. Um, as he said, I am Shanoa, um, formerly Shanoa Alamu, now Shanoa Murphy as of March 24th of this year. Um, so I did a COVID marriage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, where do I start? Um, right now I am an educator for um, two courses that I teach online, um, Introduction to Black Classical Composers and Musicians and Black Classical, Mu Black Classical Composers and Musicians, The Journey Onward, which serves as a part two. Um, violinist, uh, mom of two, bonus mom of four, um, symphony musician, I formerly taught privately um, violin and viola and closed that down as of July, 2020 to transition into what I'm doing now. Um, Suzuki kid, <laughs> try to think. Um, also have been asked to serve as a diversity, equity and inclusion facilitator for um, Suzuki organizations in particular. Um, I have a published uh, article in the American Suzuki Journal, summer edition last summer, uh, summer of 2020. Um, you know, this part is difficult for me because I forget stuff or I tend to downplay, but this is what I have come up with. <laughs> That's a, my so. least favorite question in any interview is like, <laughs> tell us a little about yourself. Well, what? what what do you want to know about me can you exactly what, tell me what you want to know and i'll let you know i'll tell you right. <laughs> and you always you manage to leave out something important um but i think what we are here to talk about today is that uh it, in the classic world of classical music we are finally giving some attention to music by black composers and black musicians. Yes. And I think something that I have heard specifically from you, and I wanna shout it from the mountaintops, that black people have been in Western classical music this whole time. This and they were just time. ignored or not included. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your discovery of these composers, your work with with uh, their music and, and how we can bring that music to the stage? That is a great, great question. Um, I like to say that I spent most of my early childhood music education not knowing, um, hardly seeing anyone of African descent um, in classical music. So. I didn't really give it much thought. It, it wasn't a thing. Um, and so it wasn't until I was in my undergrad at Cincinnati Conservatory of Music that I even began to ask myself the question. I wonder if there's anyone who looks like me who is 
uh, either a concert violinist or a concert performer concertizing, you know, both in this country and around the world or, comp or um, composing music or have composed music. And so I remember I came across William Grant Steele, um, his suite for violin and piano. And I performed that piece for one of my undergraduate um, recitals. And then I just kind of, you know, you just go on. I got caught up in making a living and, you know, as a freelancer and that sort of thing. Um, so fast forward to, to how I got to be where I am now in terms of this season of my life, actually teaching this information and educating people on this history uh, was last summer um, uh, with the shooting deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. There were protests happening in this country and around the world and in places that I never ever thought would have had their own Black Lives Matter protests, the Middle East, Scotland, you know, and so I knew that this was something different um, as opposed to previous protests for Trayvon Martin or Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, just to name a few, unfortunately. Um, and so I remembered that I had started teaching this, this history to a very small group of homeschool students in fall of 2019. My kids were a part of that first class. And so I thought, instead of being depressed, instead of getting emotional and angry and feeling hopeless and helpless, I said, let me, let me teach these classes. And so I did some more research, uh, added more composers. And as they say, the rest is history. Um, what has really been surprising in a good way is that people are hungry. They really are. I mean, the very first class that I taught, I had almost 60 adults and 26 families, because I taught two different classes, um, one being a Juilliard professor. And I was just like, like I said, just blown away. Um, of course, things did die down because it wasn't hyped and it was no longer the trend. However, it's been pretty steady. You know, people reaching out, wanting to know more, um, wanting to, know even how to incorporate this repertoire in their own personal studios for their kids. Um, so I know- well, you, you just hit the nail on the head is uh, something that my colleague on the, the National uh, Orchestra Curriculum Committee, uh, Dr. Okay. Lysandra Booth, uh, okay. she works yeah. with the, the uh, is it Wake Forest Community Orchestra or Community Youth Orchestra. Uh -huh. I, I think I'm getting one of those words wrong, but she's a youth orchestra conductor in North uh -huh. Carolina. Uh -huh. uh, is that you only know the people you know. You've got to reach out and you've got to make your circle bigger if you want to solve some of these problems. So I am a, a white male and I teach in a community that is, you know, 98.99999% white. Uh, and the, the biggest minority is uh, a Native uh, American population. Uh, okay. But I, I still have black and brown students. It's not like they aren't there. Right. Uh, but I think even in a community that is like totally white, if you're like teaching, you know, in like Ogden, Utah, and <laughs> and it's you live in that the nice neighborhood right. uh -huh. at the private and you go to the private school. Even in that school, especially in that school, I think more in that school than in, you know, a public school in, just outside of L.A., I think uh -huh. it's more important in that school, the private school in Utah, that we're learning about diversity and that we're bringing in uh, other perspectives. Absolutely. Uh, because then it, it's set, if they don't see it, if they don't see the diversity, then they think, they become adverse to it when they do see it. Absolutely. And uh, then they think this is all, you know, this is all, you know, the story that we have. This yeah, is well, they set this expectation that everybody is always going to look like me. Exactly. Anybody who means anything always looks like me. Absolutely. I was extremely lucky, so blessed 
when I was born, the governor of the state of Washington was a, a Korean man. Uh, the best musician in my whole world was a man named Dr. Paul Elliott Cobbs, who was a black man and conducted, still conducts the Tacoma Youth Symphony and brought in artists like Dr. Quentin Morris to play the Barber Violin Concerto with us. The director of the Tacoma Symphony was uh, a man named Harvey Felder, who was a black man. Not once in my musical career until I was in college, until I was an adult, did I start to look around and it's like, there are not, there's not enough black and brown people here. We're mm. doing something at the, the beginning levels that is prohibiting black and brown students from engaging with stringed instruments. And you hear people say, well, what about mariachi? But that doesn't describe the whole Latinx <laughs> community. Mariachi is like a couple of isolated communities. Like Latin music right. is so much more than mariachi. Yes. Uh, but anyhow, so now living in Port Angeles, which is a very not diverse place, uh, I feel a huge weight on my shoulders to make sure that my students experience diversity in a way that opens them rather than closes them. Right. Uh, so I, I wonder if you might have an answer to that question of when we bring diversity to people who maybe aren't expecting it, how do we set them up to have their minds be open and not closed down? That's a very good question. Um, I think one of the main reasons why people are probably their knee-jerk reaction would be to have a closed mind to it is because there has been so much um, attached to it. You know, the whole issue of diversity just in and of itself has been politicized to death. I mean, literally to death. People are sick of it. There's been so much negative energy attached to it. And so, of course, you know, for, depending on where you live and who you are, diversity just carries different meanings. And so I think if we start to uh, redefine um, and revamp what diversity really means um, and keep it positive you know what you know one, one of the one of my favorite things about the classes that I teach especially the adults is the discussions we get to have after the class um, because what I have found in teaching these courses is that this is a great way to discuss race without discussing race a great way to discuss diversity without discussing it so all I simply do is talk about Blind Tom and Florence Price and George Bridge Tower and Clarence Cameron White. And then after the discussions, the, the adults or the people, um, their eyes just start to open up and then they draw their own conclusions about why we have not heard these people, heard of these people or heard more about them. And what I like to tell them is, you know, especially if they're orchestra librarians or conductors of youth orchestras such as yourself um, or in any position of power, so to speak, I just say, you don't really have to make this a big deal. You know, this music, this information doesn't have to be talked about just during Black History Month. It doesn't have to be, you know, announced through the bullhorn, hey, we're about to program you know, uh, Florence Price's first symphony in E minor, you know, just do it. Well, that's you know? a whole nother point right there is one of my first <laughs> podcasts was with uh, a, a local uh, orchestra professor at Western Washington University, Ryan Dudenbostel is his name. Uh, and we were just talking about children's concerts. And he said, you don't, don't put any music in a corner. Don't put any kind of performance in just well, this is, you know, we play the Sorcerer's Apprentice and Star Wars and the Halloween stuff on the children's concert. And that's the children's corner. Uh, and then the children aren't welcome the rest of the season when we're doing Brahms and Debussy and mm -hmm. yes. you know, William Grant still. I mean, even right. if you're doing, so at, don't have your diversity concert where you do the one concert with 
And and even with William Grant, still people put him in the corner of we do the Afro American Symphony, but we don't do his violin sonata or the suite for violin. Right, right. Is don't put anybody or any concert in a corner uh, where it's separate. One of the we were talking before we started about uh, I. I try not to come up with a title before I do the interview, but something I was thinking about was yes and as a title. Yes. Because it, diversity is not pie. You don't lose a slice uh, by adding or acknowledging that there's a whole other half of the pie. Exactly. It's because Beethoven isn't going anywhere. Right. He, I mean, his music will be great forever. Yes. And we can celebrate music by uh, Caleb Von Jones, who wrote those amazing pieces at the Key to Change Festival. Yes. Uh, we, we can have yes and. Absolutely. It's Taking a stand Nobody for the is end. losing a piece of their pie. Yes. Exactly. That's, and that's where I'm at. And, you know, I, uh, right after uh, the killing of George Floyd, I went out and I read White Fragility uh, by Robin D'Angelo. Uh, just because I felt like it was whether or not I was going to agree with everything she said, I needed to read it and understand it and ask questions and yeah. ask uncomfortable questions of myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and my biggest takeaway from her book was that racism is a white problem for white people to solve. Because it's, it's, it's white people doing the wrong. You and said it, it, I didn't. <laughs> we, we are the ones assuming, like, um, I had a discussion in uh, one of my previous jobs uh, with some colleagues during a diversity training day, and we were talking about privilege. And somebody just said, well, I treat all my students the same. It's like, well, that assumes that all of your students grew up the same way you did. I bet you grew up, uh, you know, on a... <laughs> you know, on a small street off the, off the main road in a house with mom and dad. And I bet you had a sibling and I bet you went to school and I bet you went to church on Sunday and I bet you were in sports and I bet you had Sunday dinners and you had both grand, sets of grandparents around. Right. Now, just imagine all of the rules that you learned because of the way that you grew up. Now imagine you're the same person. You're still you but you grew up in an apartment with a single mom and maybe she's bringing boyfriends around sometimes and you're meeting other kids that aren't your siblings, but it's mom's boyfriend's kids that are in the house with you. And uh -huh. maybe you don't go to church on Sunday or you go to a different kind of church on Sunday. Right. You have a whole different set of rules of how to engage with people. Yes. So as a teacher, You've got it, and this is a quote from uh, Bob Phillips, you know, well-known uh, composer, arranger, educator. Uh, you teach the child in front of you. Mm, I like that. So it's, I'm not, I, it's, and this is something else from White Fragility, is don't be afraid of that uh, questioning, am I racist in this moment? Because there's this assumption that if I'm nice, I'm not racist. Absolutely. I think the worst racism is the people who think they're nice. Exactly. They or think, think they're being nice, nice but they're being will do right. exclusionary. They're making assumptions. Uh, and you can be perfectly nice, but totally offend someone and exclude someone. Absolutely. And so really it takes that effort of making connections and asking questions. So and you please go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, this is where the whole notion of socialization comes up. Um, there's a book that I highly recommend for your uh, viewers called The Racial Healing Handbook. Um, can't remember the author's name because she is of um, Indian descent, um, so I don't want to mispronounce her name, but it is called The Racial Healing Handbook. Um, and she talks about socialization and how people are socialized to be um, the racial beings that we are. And I think people can kind of swallow that pill a bit better because 
we all know that if we want, and, and I'm not necessarily saying we, we, I mean, we are mammals, of course, but we see this a lot in the animal kingdom, you know, how animals are socialized from the wild into, you know, becoming domesticated and what that process looks like, um, the habits that they have to, quote unquote, learn and the environments that they have to be introduced to or reintroduced to. Uh, and I just feel like the same thing has happened to human beings in this country along racial and gender uh, sexual orientation lines. What are we socialized or how are we socialized to think, behave, feel, and act when it comes to race and racism? And that in and of itself looks completely different for the most part for African Americans and other marginalized groups, um, as well as members of the dominant society. So I think when people start to really think and ask themselves questions from that perspective, what was I socialized to believe? What were, what were conversations that took place around the dinner table, if there even was a dinner table? What was said? What was not said? Um, even though my parents may have told me that everyone is welcome um, and that we don't hate anybody, but who, was, who did I actually play with as a child? Who did I actually see as my doctor, as my teachers, as my pastors, as my, you know, mentors or as my professors, you know? And so that's where this cognitive dissonance can take place, you know? Well, and, and we've got to get over uh, this socialization that you're talking about, because I think we all, including the nice uh, people who don't oh, think they're racist. especially the nice people. <laughs> especially the nice people. Because uh, we all want to get to this place where, for example, like an audition for an orchestra, we hire the best performer. Right. Like we do blind auditions for that reason. So we get the best performer. It's yes. like, you know, nope, that G sharp was not in tune. That G sharp was in tune. That's the person who gets the job. Right. Uh, but they, there are still subtle ways that we still allow not just racism, but systemic racism and systemic uh, classism also, uh, and just assuming based on someone's appearance that they are of a certain class or that they won't fit in with the group. And that's a whole yeah. other kind of exclusionary behavior that I think is unacceptable. Yes. Um, but we've got to get these subtle things. We need to call each other out and be comfortable with it. Because yes. um, when, as someone who practices anti-racism, when I tell someone, I think that might be a little bit racist and we need to talk about that. What I'm not saying is I think you're a bad person. And I think a lot of white people, when they hear the call out of, whoa, you can't say that, or... I think we need to talk about what you just said. It's not, I think you're a bad person. We're not taking it all the way to the, I think you're a genocidal maniac. <laughs> it's just like when a little kid is going around in public picking their nose, we tell them, hey, that's, that's not appropriate. We don't, that's in our society, we don't do that. That's not acceptable to walk around in public with your finger up your nose. It doesn't mean I don't love you anymore. <laughs> it means get your finger out your nose. <laughs> and if we can look at anti-racism that way, I'm not telling you you're a bad person. I'm telling you that there are some social things that we need to understand differently. Absolutely. And then again, we need to, I'm all about definitions. And, and because again, the name or the term racist or racism people automatically have pitchforks and pointed hats and burning crosses and lynchings and mobs in their head, you know? And I like to, and I like to also use the word spectrum. You know, there's a spectrum of being a racist. Now the KKK is one spectrum and then the nice person is another spectrum. But again, you're socialized to to put all of your energies, your time, your beliefs, your hopes, your money 
into the hands of people of the of the uh, dominant society. You go and shop to Walmart. You go shop in Target. All of the, you know, and so that's why when people say there's no such thing as racism, I'm thinking, you know, I, I just, I remember moving here to Springfield, Illinois in 2008 and having to search for a beautician. Now, of course, Springfield is a predominantly white area. I, I get that. But the fact that in this country, this country that we say is a melting pot, this country that we say is, you know, equal and, and free for everyone, home of the, you know, land of the free, home of the brave. And yet I have to shop and specifically hunt for a place to get my hair cut or hair done, you know, or go in department stores and it may not be the shade of makeup, foundation makeup that's, you know, dark enough for my complexion you know there are areas in this country where people such as myself have to do these type of hunts you know um but again everywhere is for the benefit of you know white people putting money in their pockets every time we shop at amazon mcdonald's it's, it's, the, it's just like like environmentalism we yes. look at the big the big corporations pumping out tons of pollution in the smokestacks at the factory, but yes. the the real persistent uh, pernicious problem is the person who just th the millions billions of people who just throw the single use plastic wrapper on the side of the road mm -hmm. because there is way more of them doing that small action than the, the big company doing the big uh, harm to the environment, which is just like the KKK is a terrible organization who believes terrible things. That and is of still course, when we think of racism, uh -huh. that's the symbol or the group that we think of. But yes. the more pernicious forms of racism are the uh, a shopkeeper who gets defensive when a black person walks into their store. Yes. Or ask them to leave. Yes. Or follows or them around follow thinking them that yes. they're going to steal something. Right. That that is the more pernicious problem that we need to deal with. And just ask yourself, if you're that person, what about this person really is suspicious to me? Is it the mm -hmm. color of their skin mm -hmm. or is it the way that they're behaving? Right. Because but again, that could be well, anybody. Right. But at the same time, it it was I think it's a statistic that is out is that 77% or at least, you know, that amount of white people do not have a person of color in their social circle. Yep. That is a very, very high number. So then you have to ask, well, where are they learning about black people and other groups? Music, movies, mm -hmm. other forms of entertainment, Mm -hmm. Um, and so if that is your only diet or your primary mm -hmm. diet mm -hmm. of learning about a, an entire group of people that you do not have the experience of socializing with, unless they're on your job, you know, but even then you're not going to engage with them from an unbiased mind. You're just not, because if most of your time is spent watching you know, um, I, I like to say low vibrating entertainment, you know, about black people, then when you see a black woman or you see a black man in your, you know, on your job. That's what your is program, triggered in your mind. Absolutely. Again, socialization. So mm -hmm. that's why I no longer, of course, I still have my moments when I get angry. I, I was angry just this week about something but when I when I know up from it from that perspective then it's kind of like well I get why why people don't get it you know like I understand it doesn't make it right but I'm I, I get it because if you're if you've been conditioned and socialized to be that far removed from others mm -hmm. so to speak from other then this is I mean how else would you behave I, well, you know, I went to high school in Olympia, Washington, which is a very liberal city. 
uh-huh. it's a very white city. Uh, I was one of those people that thought we were done with racism because I didn't see it. It was happening there. It was uh-huh. happening, but I didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the first time I had a layover in the St. Louis airport, and I look at the Burger King, it's all white people. And then I look at the McDonald's, and it's all black people. And then I look at the Starbucks, and it's all white people. And you look down each restaurant, each business, nobody wants to cohabitate. And that was a big red flag for me that if people are choosing to self-segregate, obviously we still have a problem. It's just, it's not that it's out in the middle of the street. Well, back in 2012, when, when this happened, it wasn't out in the middle of the street. Well, it was in some places, uh, but it was subtle. And we were choosing to kick the can down the road and not deal with it. Exactly. Instead of asking the question of why can't we all work at Burger King together? It's still flipping burgers. We're just working a job. And maybe we'll come to understand each other better. I think speaking on behalf of the white people I know, <laughs> we we love to avoid an uncomfortable situation. Who doesn't? And uh, by because making again, those choices, they avoid again, it. You're socialized for everything to be catered to you. Yes. So there is a huge level of comfort that just mm-hmm. comes with being white. And so why would you choose to be uncomfortable when there's so much else that says you don't have to be? Well, I I can only speak for myself, but the discomfort doesn't last that long once you crack the lid. And you just, you know, you figure out real quick who is someone I can ask about this thing that I'm on the fence about. Who is my safe person that isn't going to judge me, isn't going to, Uh, Because like we've already established, uh, someone who has a racist act that does a racist act is not necessarily a, you know, bad person, a racist person, but they are participating in racism. And you need to be able to ask yourself about your actions. Was that act racist? And then I don't have to you know, go home and beat myself and give myself 40 lashes, I can just analyze and move forward and expand my circle and ask questions and de-socialize some of the the wrong things or not wrong as much as exclusive things that I had learned. Okay, so what would keep you from saying that that was wrong? Because I think that is wrong to exclude. Oh, Oh, no, well... Um, yes, it is wrong to exclude, uh, but you don't see it from the perspective of, I wasn't being taught anything malicious in my socialization, gotcha. but it is the exclusion that is the result of that socialization is wrong. And what yeah. happened just now where we disagreed and we got back on track, Yes. That, that's the uncomfortable place we're asking people to go. And it's, it's yes. not so bad. Right. And if we wanted to dig deeper and help figure it out, I, I want to be called out. I want to nip it in the bud before that uh, evil seed grows into a nasty weed. Right. But, you know, and, and, you know, you're still alive. You know, there's still, but, you know, I, I have the copy of White Fragility, um, although I have not um, read it. Um, But there's this, but again, when you haven't been given the language on what words to use or what words actually mean, uh, if you haven't been given the language, if you haven't been given um, again, if, if you have just been disempowered to just not engage in anything having to do with racism or other people groups or you know um then you're just going to be weakened you know you're, you're just not going to 
you know, or at least you, in your mind, you're thinking it, it'll feel like death, <laughs> you know, to be wrong or to be labeled a racist or to be, you know, because that was, that is one thing that continues to boggle my mind. I'm thinking, you know, people would do anything to not be called a racist. And yet people groups all over this world have been called way worse than that, have been treated way worse. So I don't know if that's a question you can well, the, ask. The you discomfort know, like, that you that experience as someone participating in racism is not equal to getting murdered in your own bed for the color right. of your skin. Right. That discomfort is not equal to being afraid of the people that are meant to protect us. Mm. I don't wish that on anybody. The, so our what, police okay. officers, we should trust. These right. are people that we should trust and teach our children. If you know, if you lose mommy or daddy, that's you trust the police officer. That, that should be what we expect. The police yes. officers I know, I, certainly, I would tell that to any child, but I'm a white person. And the children I deal with are white children for the most part. Yes. Uh, and, you know, to, to that extent, we all want a world where we can trust our law enforcement. Absolutely. And, and the, the, but the real point I was making before we went real deep there uh, was okay. <laughs> that the, the, the discomfort of being called a racist is not equal to being afraid of the people that are meant to protect us. Right. Or just afraid for your very life. You know, even though I have had, you know, what I would consider healthy relationships with white people, you know, just who I work with um, and, and that work relationship has carried over um, to a large degree into my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, and I just lost my train of thought, but it'll come because that tends to happen. <laughs> um, so what was I about to say? I'm sorry, or what? Yeah, that happens. I, if, if it comes back, please let me know. Um, okay. But as we're thinking about our tar target audience with this is orchestra teachers. Yes. So we've had this, this whole buildup. Uh, here's a hypothetical. And maybe this is something that you lived and experienced and can help us out as orchestra teachers. Uh, I... When I'm just rehearsing my mm -hmm. orchestra in class, uh -huh. and let's say a, a black or brown, BIPOC, LGBTQ, every, every other inclusive term we could possibly use, walks <laughs> yeah. past my classroom and they look through the window, what can I do as a teacher so that when they look in that window, whether or not they see someone who looks like them in my classroom, just by looking in my classroom, they know they would be welcome. How can I work to make each child know that they are welcome in my classroom just by walking past? Wow. I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure if they will automatically assume they're, war they're welcome just by looking. Um, because I immediately put myself in that scenario and I wouldn't think I was welcome just by, you know, face value, just by- I don't blame you. Home. Yeah, it's a huge problem. Right, but if that same teacher made it a point to reach out to me and be intentional about, hey, why don't you consider being in orchestra? Are you interested, you know? that would go over more to me than just simply expecting me to feel welcome just by walking by. And I understand what you're saying, but that's, I, I, going back to lack of diversity just in classical music, I think that's part of the problem. Expecting, yes. expecting Black children or other uh, children of color to just automatically want to get on board just be you know because again that the written rule is well it's here my class is here and i'm not excluding anyone i'm not doing xyz so why don't why aren't why that's don't I the have socialization to coming back right exactly we're, we're not doing practices where that student knows on the first day of orchestra 
that you might be the only BIPOC student in the room, but you are still welcome. And I'm going to go out of my way to understand the differences in our socialization so that yeah. you feel welcome. And I, and I think that needs to be emphasized because a lot of people feel like um, you know, orchestra teachers or other positions of authority, they feel like, well, I don't want to show special treatment or I don't want the other kids to feel like, you know, left out and whatnot. But again, if, if we, if to do nothing is to just leave things in the default state, it is a default in this country for us to remain segregated. I don't care what, I don't care you know, has diversity come a long way in a lot of circles and a lot of industries? Yes. But our churches are still segregated. Our schools are still segregated. Um, our social circles, for the most part, especially uh, with white people, are still segregated because we have to go into your world in order to make a living, in order to survive, you know, but it's not the other way around. So with that being said, orchestra teachers, white orchestra teachers, are going to have to be intentional. You're going to have to put, you know, feet to the fire, feet to the pavement, and make it a point to reach out to those students who you feel, you know, would benefit from an orchestral uh, education. Well, and if, if we're talking best practice, that's not special treatment for that child. Shouldn't you be doing that for every child? If we're going to follow what Bob Phillips tells us to do, and teach the child in front of you, like, uh, you know, who, who doesn't do this? First day of school, you hand out a little note card, give me your name, tell me your favorite color, and mm -hmm. just get, some, get to know what are some important things to you. And exactly. you want to, if you're being, doing best practice, being a great teacher, you're going to have that, uh, this, I think this is the right word in this situation, intimate understanding of each of your students, if yes. you really want to make an impact. Yes, And then maybe by the time you get to high school, when, you know, a young Shanoa walks past her classroom, she's going to see some people that look like her in yes. the orchestra and then yeah. identify uh, at the high school age because you did the work with the elementary students. Absolutely. Because if an elementary student knows or, or is taught that they, there's historical presence of Black classical composers and musicians. I think that's half the battle. But, you know, again, socialization, you know, for the most part, not saying this represents every Black person, but for the most part, if you're Black American, rap music, hip hop music um, is going to be what you're socialized to, to listen to. Uh, it serves as the voice for the community. It serves as what it means to even be Black. And so, again, to hear classical music, to see classical music is just the opposite. But if Black children, like you said, on the elementary level, know, hey, here's Florence Price. Here's, you know, did you know that Bridge Tower um, was once, you know, a sonata was once dedicated to him by Beethoven, you know, just these bits of information um, that I think would affirm that, hey, we have a presence in this genre as well as us, other genres. I was just talking yesterday with somebody who I'm a, a repeat offender I'm about to have back on the podcast <laughs> okay. uh, and talking about in the, the like bluegrass community. Yes. One of the first and best fiddle players to be recorded stuff smith black man uh -huh. and i mean his solos still to this day are golden i mean you will see people in their nashville apartments putting on the record and you know they got one of them special record players where they can turn it on slow <laughs> and learn the solo uh -huh. because he he's a legend that we still we put other people in front of him or when uh, we want to listen to his solos as Spotify sells it as the name of the big band he was a part of. Oh, okay. Not, uh, you know, uh -huh. that's their, uh -huh. their way of whitewashing it. Um, uh, I, I, as something that I'm trying to do with the, the NAFME National Orchestra Council and our, uh, the chair of this committee, uh, Beth Fortune, 
who also mm -hmm. teaches in Washington State. Something that we are really hung hungry for is pedagogic music. So yeah. music for beginners, music for everything except college. All in between, yeah. beginner all the way up to college. Because 90% of our students, I mean, if they play in college, they're not going to go on to be professional. That's just a reality. Right. Uh, but music is still a powerful, powerful tool. Yes. I, I think is necessary in an education. Uh, yes. And we need more tools in our toolbox uh, to, to teach these kids, you know, whoever's writing them. Uh, in my position is, this is something that I have said on the record many times, I've got a shelf full of Richard Meyer. He, he's a good guy. He writes some really good tunes. Dragon Hunter is one of the best tunes. You got, you use just D minor, you know, finger pattern two. You can play a song with your like first year players at the end of the year. It's great. But I don't need another Richard Meyer tune. I need a Caleb Von Jones tune. Yes. Uh, because a lot of the music that does exist that is accessible, that I can purchase as a teacher by uh, William Grant Still or uh, the um, George Walker uh, is not accessible to learning students. No. It's, it's difficult it's music. It's yes. music at the highest level. And yes. let's, let's pay respect to those people for writing at that level. Yes. Uh, but as a teacher, I need more representation at the, the educational level. Yes. So uh, I'm, as somebody who is like a, a little more involved with this, and probably you know some of these composers writing this music, I know it exists, but how can we as orchestra teachers, white, black, brown, yellow, whatever color we are, find these composers and find this music and necessitate that the companies like FJH and Alfred and JW Pepper start selling this stuff because we're not buying the other stuff anymore. So how can we find these people? That's a great question. Um, I don't, I'm pretty sure you would know um, that there's music by Black composers uh, by Rachel Barton Pine. Um, that's really like the best, one of the best selling, if not the best selling um, books right now um, through Shar and her website as well. Um, otherwise, and personally, I've seen or have found music uh, by Florence Price on sheetmusicplus.com. Um, what people have also done is has, have taken uh, like art songs by Black composers and have arranged them for solo instruments. Um, there's also IML, what is it? IMLSP. The IMSLP, ORG. the International yes, Music IMSLP. Score Library Project. <laughs> <laughs> IMSLP.org um, is also um, another resource. And just have to start investigating. Like, seriously, if you do know of publishing companies, you know, to call and, and ask them um, in terms of living composers who are writing music um, for, for kids, you know, elementary and on up, Caleb Van Jones, I just found out about him, you know. Um, I think the downside is, I know for me, is that it can easily get discouraging and exhausting to just think about all that that's, you know, that's lacking. Um, so I'm sitting here now thinking maybe I should step up to the plate more and just really because I've started making this information as like an educational curriculum in the works, but as far as repertoire and arranging, um, I know Rachel Barton Pine is working on, uh, cause currently music by black composers is for violin. From what I understand, she's working on one for viola. Um, and then there are also two Suzuki teachers um, who have released free PDFs um, I don't know if I've sent this to you or not, free, free PDFs um, called Integrating uh, Music by Black Composers and also Integrating Music by Female Women Composers. 
Um, however, it's according to the Suzuki books. Um, but still, it's, it's a resource that's out there. And again, these ladies are offering it for free. I can send that to you as well if, if for any listeners who would be interested. Because what I like about it is that it also breaks down the skill sets that are introduced mm -hmm. um, that align with the Suzuki um, books. But otherwise, um, like, like I recently received... Um, a string quartet by Joseph Ballone, uh, his string quartet in G minor. I had to request Ooh, that. From I the love UK, that. You know, but I had to request it from the well, UK and because it's not here. Mm -hmm. I was about to ask a follow-up question. Uh -huh. So uh, after George Floyd was murdered, I felt very strongly uh, that there was something that I needed to do to show the students who were af affected by this, who were a uh, emotionally feeling this, that I, I'm i feeling this as well. And if you wanna talk about it, I am a safe person that you can talk about it with, but as a public school educator, not make you know a, an inappropriate fuss about it or make any statements that, that just aren't necessary. Uh -huh. um, so I found, I forget the name of the group, but it's a vocal arrangement of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Okay. And, uh, I, t I still listen to that sometimes and there are uh -huh. tears flowing down my eyes. And uh -huh. if there's ever an opportunity to switch national anthems to that, I think <laughs> it's so much better captures our nation and our history and right. our complicated past. Yes. Let's acknowledge that and integrate uh -huh. it. Yes. Uh, but I got a good reaction from sharing that video with my students. And I was good. thinking, I would love to have an arrangement of Lift Every Voice and Sing for my orchestra to play. Uh, but the only one that exists that I can purchase is arranged by a white person. And I don't feel comfortable putting yeah. that in front of my students. Yeah. So uh, a question for you. Uh, let's, it, let's say it's a different piece of music altogether, a different situation. Uh, there's a piece by a, a Black person, Black composer, that uh, a teacher wants to put in front of their students. Uh, but it needs to be arranged. What what do they need to think about and what's the right way to get that done so that we're being authentic to the composer and to what we're trying to achieve? Wow. Could you ask that in a different way? Um, yes. I think I understand what you're saying, but just for my own brain, if you can help me. Uh-huh. So let's say I'm a, a, a white person teaching in Montana. Right. And uh, I found a gospel tune mm -hmm. that I really like, and I would love to arrange it for my string orchestra. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's let's say it's, it's written by uh, uh, a, a Black person that was writing gospel music. Uh, I can't think of anyone yeah, in particular off the top. Yeah. Like Moses Hogan. Let's put Moses Hogan out there. Okay. Uh, Well, first of all, would it be appropriate for me as a white teacher to arrange that? And then B, if it's not, uh, what do, what can I do to find someone uh, who could arrange it appropriately? Yeah, you know, I had this discussion with, um, with the Suzuki teacher yesterday because that's where appropriation comes into play. I might feel differently about what appropriation actually is. Um, my understanding of it is taking something uh, from another culture and not giving credit to whatever that is. That's my understanding of it. Um, so if you were to choose to do uh, an arrangement of Lift Every Voice and Sing for orchestra, um, just don't say that you were the one that wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. <laughs> you know, just just say, okay, it was written by, you know, uh, James Weldon Johnson and his brother was the, you know, librettist and, and uh, this is just my arrangement. Because there is an arrangement of a piece by Florence Price, Adoration, um, that was originally composed for organ 
which has since been composed or arranged for um, a solo instrument, Elaine Fine. Um, so what you see is, you know, adoration, Florence Price, arrangement, Elaine Fine. I personally think that is okay. You know, you're just the arranger and, and you know, Beethoven's music has been arranged, his symphonies have been rearranged for high school orchestras and, you know, just these abridged versions that we have access to. Be we still know it's from Beethoven. Yes. You know, because at this point, you know, unless you were to take the steps to reach out to Black composers mm -hmm. just to see, you know, if they've done their own arrangements of things, that's one thing. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just give credit where credit is due. Is my point. I, I can get behind that. I think because there, you know, how many times has just you got a piece of music by anybody, and exactly. the viola part isn't working for your group that you have that year, and exactly. so you make some small, and you just it's still by the original composer. Right. Uh, I think what I'm after on the big scale is if I'm uh, the editor at J.W. Pepper and I have an opportunity to do a new arrangement of the one of the, the fourth movement of the Afro-American Symphony for string orchestra. Oh, uh -huh. In that case, I've got all the money, I've got all the power. Do I give it to Richard Meyer or do I find a person of color a black person, I would hope, who's got some connection, who's got some, you know, boots on the ground with this music, with this community, and is really going to do it justice. Uh, in that case, somebody... in mm -hmm. that case, yes, I would definitely take the steps to find someone who could mm -hmm. do that, a person of color, a black person. Definitely. Because that's the, the kind of the pernicious uh, systemic stuff that we've been talking yep. about. Exactly. Because, you know, because if, if I'm, uh, you know, I don't want to name names and make anybody uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. Oh, right. geez. <laughs> now I'm playing right into my hands. I sh Maybe what? I should name names. But let's say I'm a, a, a well-received composer and I'm a white person. Mm -hmm. And I just, with my own students, because I compose and I teach, if I do that arrangement and I still give credit where credit is due, but now J.W. Pepper picks it up, I would be like, you know what? Not comfortable with that. That would be my amp in that position. Just right. me arranging it for my students, I'm comfortable with that. But if there's money being made, exactly. uh, then I think we need to honor the composer a little bit differently. Absolutely. And that, maybe it, that's it, the gray area that, that we yeah. found earlier. Yes, and, and you know, that is that right there is what people aren't willing to do because it, it does take extra time. It does, it's not the easy route. Um, because again, uh, things that just flow naturally or, or just default is automatically going to exclude, is automatically going to overlook, is automatically going to, um, you know, look a certain way. And so in order to change that and be diverse and be inclusive and all these buzzwords that we're hearing and saying now, it takes being intentional, stepping out of mm. your comfort zone, taking just a few extra time, minutes to look and research and investigate because this isn't normally how things are done. Well, and it makes it so hard because teachers, or at least the ones who, who matter, we're not doing it for the money. If I if I was looking to, you know, make that paper, I'd be doing something different. I right. Mean, let's be honest. <laughs> right. But composers are trying to make money. Right. Publishing houses are trying to make money. Yes. And so they're going to go with what's easiest, what's quickest, what's going to sell Absolutely. best. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that and does who not they know. push who they, and, who and who they, they know. already have relationship with who they already know, who they already have established a, you know, good business relationship with, mm -hmm. it all, it all. <laughs> well, Woo. so I, I challenge any composer who is listening to this that is one of those people that if J.W. Pepper or another publishing house asks you 
to arrange or can you write a piece in memorial of, I think you have so much power to enable another composer who hasn't been given us a, a place yet, give that person the place, give them the lift up to the position where now they're in the circle of trust for J right. JW Pepper or whoever right. it is. So, right. you know, and if, then if you're listening, the of, yeah. Yeah, and then there's the question of how would a composer even get the attention of, you know, someone on that caliber? You know, how would they be seen? How would they, you know, break through that glass, so to speak? So it's, it's a mixed bag in so many different ways, which again, this is part of the work because if we just take everything at face value, then yeah, it looks fair, it looks clean. The words say this, it means that. But as you can see, as what we're discussing now, there's so much underneath mm -hmm. that people do not think to consider. And it takes a lot of brain power. <laughs> Well, I think you know, which uh, is what re some real fast. action that we can do today, that we uh -huh. can influence people to do today, is if you are, let's say you're a Suzuki teacher, or you're an elementary school orchestra teacher, the materials that you put in front of your students as a Suzuki teacher, as an elementary school teacher, influence the publishing market in a very big way. If the publishers find out nobody's buying essential elements anymore, that we're buying sound innovations because they have on their DVD where they show, you know, hand positions, that they've got an equal, accurate distribution of the American population in their student representation. If they see we're making those kinds of choices, and Yes, I still teach Suzuki, but I'm buying this special insert from Rachel Barton Pine that includes music by Black composers. Yes. So we we speak with our dollars. Absolutely. So anybody listening, if you want to change this, you've got Richard Meyer on your shelf. You see another Richard Meyer piece, it looks good, sounds good. I'm going to encourage you to get uncomfortable find some people, talk to some university professors, find out who's a recent graduate of your school that is a BIPOC composer who has the ability to write for students. And hey, I'll, I'll put it out there, find my email, send me a YouTube comment. I will go in on a consortium project if it helps you get that grade two uh, piece by a black composer for your students. Let's That's work together awesome. to get these out of there. Yes, and that's, absolutely. You know, the uh, co collegiate wind ensembles have been doing this forever of, hey, we've got five schools. We want a, a new piece that features bass clarinet. Uh, and they all pitch in <laughs> a little bit and they all get to premiere and they all get their names at the top of the score. But we could be doing this to get, you know, the next uh, lightly row for our elementary students. Yes. Let's go in it together, however much money this person wants. Uh, and and we get the little credit of, you know, funded by the consortium of, you know, these schools or these directors. If you really need that ego trip, personally, I don't. I just want to get that music in front of students. Mm -hmm. uh, because then the publishers, they're going to see that as, oh, well, I guess Richard Meyer doesn't sell anymore. And they're going to, oh. Caleb Von Jones is selling. This is a popular composer. Absolutely. Uh, seems like we want to get on the diversity train. Yeah. Uh, but let's, uh, we're, I, I want to respect your time here. Let's, we're, we're approaching the denouement of this conversation, but we do need to look <laughs> okay. at the, fl the flip side of this whole thing is uh, when the NAFME uh, Council met with a group of Black composers. Uh, we asked, would you want to be on a list of, you know, diversity positive or black composers? And one of our uh, guests said, I want to be received as on my merits, that I am a composer of, of quality and of merit on my own two feet, 
And no, I don't want to be on a list of diverse composers. So how do we, with respect to everybody's wishes, promote the music of Black composers without putting them in a corner of here's the diversity box? Because I think that presents its own danger. Uh, well, like, like I've told people before, just don't have a box. You know, and, and you know, every person is different. Perhaps, you know, Florence Price made you know, she's quoted as saying something similar that she felt like she had two handicaps against her, one having Negro blood in her veins and of, you know, being a woman and that she would like to be judged on merit alone. Um, but then someone else may feel differently about that. I have told people, you know, just don't make it a big deal in the sense of, you know, having, you know, cause see now there's like special funding for diversity efforts and there's like special programming and special that, you know, if we really want it, and, and this is just my opinion, you know, do what the Detroit Symphony is doing. It has gotten flack about, you know, keep your Beethoven, keep your Mozart on your programs, but add William Grant Steele. Yes, as, you know, and. Yes. Right. The yes and. And so, you know, some people feel like there's a need for the diversity box because that's how it will get attention. And then some people feel like there isn't. So perhaps this is one of those yes and situations. I mean, I teach in, in a very purple county. <laughs> uh, I'm not making any friends by going on the local radio station and saying, the Port Angeles High School Orchestra will be only playing music by Black composers all year. You know, that's uh, that's not going to get me the best attention. That doesn't right. mean that it would be wrong to do that. I mean, I, right. that would be a lot of fun for me. I would love to do right. that. Uh -huh. uh, but I think the approach that's going to erode the socialization and the systemic racism at work is maybe it's every concert, maybe it's every other concert, just throw in that Florence Price piece and do the does. Brian Balmagis and that Beethoven arrangement by, you know, whoever did. Absolutely. Uh, and then the music speaks for itself that yes. I'm not out here, you know, waving the flag saying, you know, divert, get on the diversity train. Here we go. It's just, Hey, I'm Mr. Rodol. I'm the orchestra teacher. I am here to teach your son or daughter how to play their instrument. Well, Absolutely. And, and here is the repertoire for the fall concert. Uh, no big deal about it. Uh, you know, if it's if we're doing a premiere, of course, I'm going to make a big deal about it. If right. this is the first time this piece by Florence Price has been heard, exactly. arranged for string orchestra, I'm going right. to talk about Florence Price and why she's important. Right. Uh, but that's uh, that's how we do that incremental change that changes the socialization of what to expect. Exactly. And, and the, 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 the pie analogy of that it's, it's not pie. You don't lose your slice because there is a whole nother half. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, there's always room for another two minute grade two piece on my program. If Caleb Von Jones wants to write me a grade two, you listen to his music. You don't know that it's Caleb Von Jones is a black man. Exactly. You just, like, you just think, oh, that's a new song. I haven't heard that one before. That sure is nice. And you ask me about it after, and I'll say, this, oh, Caleb Von Jones, he's a local composer. He does some really cool work, and and he happens to be a Black man. Exactly. Right. Uh, other people want to be, like, totally up in your face, in the community, you know, you know, really shaking the shackles, keeping everybody from uh, moving ahead. And... You know, I, I want to undo the chains of uh, systemic racism as well. Yes. Uh, but there's there's so many subtle things to change that we need yes. to acknowledge. And yes. we can make these changes without making a huge fuss. Exactly. And we, we can get people past that uncomfortable situation uh, without really bringing it up. So they, yes. they get to stay comfortable and we undo the systemic racism in their, our community. And, and at the risk of simplifying this too much, 
um, just think about it as if you're used to eating, I don't know, American food, whether it's cheeseburgers and fries or pizza yeah. or, you know, spaghetti, even though spaghetti is not American. But, you know, if you, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you're used to eating a certain way and you want to start changing things up, you know, you might want to announce it to the family that we're going to start eating this way. Or you might just say, hey, once a week, we're not going to have meat or twice a week we're gonna you know what i'm saying like that's a beautiful analogy you don't show okay. up to your your family of ranchers and say we're right. eating vegan from now on right but maybe just one night you make a vegan dish you don't say it's vegan and you just you trojan horse the veganism <laughs> into the yeah. family of meat eaters <laughs> yeah and you just sneak it in and maybe they sit hey there was that thing you made on Thursday. I really like that. Is there leftovers of that? Exactly. And, and that's how we do it. I do think that doesn't mean that we don't have some people that aren't out there being loud and proud. Right. And and I respect the people who are willing to to go there. Yes. Uh, and there have been times when it needs to be me to go there. And and yes. and white people, that's our job is to find that uncomfortable space where it's your turn. It's your turn to be uncomfortable. Uh, and, and it can be hard to identify and even harder to accept once he's like, oh, it's my turn. Yeah. But step up. Uh, but the in the meantime, until you have that calling to, to make the big statement, mm -hmm. uh, yes and to the music uh, by Black composers. Yes. And there are more and more research, uh, resources coming out every day yes. of how to put a di diverse sets of materials in front of student musicians. There's yes. just, there's so much. Uh, you yes. can't ignore it anymore. And by incorporating those tools, we, we undo the, the publishing pipeline that is preventing these people from getting published alongside the, the regulars. Yes. And um, I don't know if you'd like to end uh, with this, but I recently um, taught this information, taught this history to a group of students out of Oak Park String Academy in Illinois. Uh, their teacher is Meg uh, Kelso. And these students, I talked to them about Blind Tom or Thomas Wiggins. Uh, Florence Price and George Bridge Tower. And when I tell you that when it got to giving comments and questions and takeaways and aha moments, these kids on their own, again, I simply just taught the history. On their own, they said, the only reason why Beethoven did not or was so quick to take away the dedication of his sonata from George Bridge Tower is because he was black. Now, if I were to tell that, people would automatically assume that I was referring to black students. But all of these students were white, except for one, he was an Asian um, child. And these kids were between the ages of nine and 14. So that was the best experience for me showing and proving that if you teach the information, the teach the history, the kids will get it because they were all over it. I mean, they were just calling it out left and right. And I even, you know, mentioned to the, to Meg, I was like, I had no idea you had such a woke studio. <laughs> well, because that's children. Know. I mean, you're a parent. Children know right from wrong at yes. a very early age. Yes. And unless we teach them otherwise, and that's the socialization, that's the systemic racism at work, is yes. we teach them that some wrong things are okay. Uh, but, but children know right from wrong really well. Because what, right. if the youngest student in that room, when you said Beethoven took it away from him, well, what's one of the first things we teach children? It's wrong to steal. It's wrong right. to take something that doesn't belong to you. Right. 
and and it was a nice thing that was trying to be done there. Or um, what Beethoven that, should have done was just given him another chance, you know. Precisely. And yeah. So where I do like to end is I ask all of my guests the same oh. question. I have okay. a question, and it's the same one. Uh, if you could think back to a time in your life, uh, and if it's not musically related, it's fine. Uh, oftentimes it, it does end up being music related, but it doesn't have to be, uh, that you were experiencing a particular struggle, a time in your life when you were having a struggle. Mm -hmm. Since you know I'm a high school teacher, uh, I'm trying to empower my students to overcome whatever struggles they're going through. Uh, think of a time when you were having difficulty and what advice would you give yourself if you could today that would have helped you get through it or avoid the struggle or have just you know kept going and made it to the other side? What advice would you give your past self during that struggle? That I am my own rescue that I have the tools, um, that I have the tools, that I have what it takes to get through any struggle. And it's not, it's no longer a cliche for me because I've done just a little bit of study in the neuroscience industry about our brains and just how our, you know, the fact that our bodies just automatically heal itself and just what our brains go through to adapt to difficult situations and to overcome traumas and whatnot. We are divinely created to overcome obstacles. So that's what I would tell myself that I am my own rescue. That you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've I've got you know, in the last year or so, there have been some students in some difficult situations. And as a public school teacher, you, you've you only got so many services available to you, but you've got to go home to your own house, but you take the job home with you because you're worried about mm. that student. Are they safe? Yeah. Are they going to be okay? You know, are they fed? You know, I'm not worried so much about my students being fed because I think that's one thing that my community does really well is making sure that, that no child goes hungry. And that's yeah. tremendous. Yeah. Uh, but feeling safe uh, is so important. And uh, I hope all of the students who watch this and any teachers out there uh, empower your students to know that they are their own rescue. That's a powerful message that you don't have to wait for somebody to come and be your hero. You can stand up and say, this is wrong. You don't get to do that to me. You don't get to say that to me. And there is somebody. And if it's a teacher, we are mandated reporters. You tell us we will do something about it. Yes. Uh, and, and those of us who are gentle, we will find the right way of going about it. Because there are delicate situations where it needs to be handled a certain way. It needs to come from a certain angle. And that's mm -hmm. in the, the realm of music, I think. Us music teachers, for whatever reason, we've survived our own trauma. Or we just, because of that connection to the music, we understand it deeper. Yeah. Uh, but I, I hope everybody out there hears and receives that you are your own rescue. And, and I know I'm here. And Shenna was here. If you if you need support, be in your own rescue. We we are here, here for you to empower you as a musician and as a person. Yes. And and music is just our vehicle. I yeah. I, I am the first one to say that the most important thing I teach in my classroom may not be music. Absolutely, music is just a tool. Music is a tool that makes good people. I mean, an orchestra in particular, that, that, oh, all the good kids are in orchestra. Orchestra makes the good kids. I'm sorry. It's not that the good kids are in orchestra. Orchestra makes the good kids. 
band makes the good kids choir makes the good kids it's not that the good kids are in music i love that (laughs) oh well uh it has been such a pleasure to interview you and we took some deep dives i did not expect to take yeah uh, but i i thank you for for making space for me to ask some questions and help Absolutely. me understand your story your perspective uh and i i hope others uh get the courage to ask themselves some questions too absolutely uh, before we sign off uh i will uh put certainly some links of things that we've talked about in the comments uh in the description of the video uh, but how can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing? That's a great question. Um, I do have a website that is sorely in need of updating, um, but I do have a website, uh, blackclassicalmusicians.com. Um, I can also be reached um, email, Shanoa, C-H-E-N-O-A, at blackclassicalmusicians.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, Black Classical Musicians too. Um, other than that, that's, that's pretty much it. Beautiful. So well, much, I've got there. some more questions afterwards, uh, after we stop the recording, but yes. thank you so much uh, for speaking thank with you, me. Thank uh, I, I hope lots of people watch this one. This is a great one. Thank uh, I hope you. I can have you back uh, to talk again. Absolutely. uh, Let's let let this sit for a little bit, see how people receive it, and let's talk again. (laughs) Sure, no problem. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you.